Okay, we'll start in a minute or two. I'm just finishing the attendance. My goodness. Okay, close enough. Um, we're doing chapter six today. And we're not having a test until, I guess, the week after next. Um, but chapter six is a mother of a chapter, so be very careful. Try not to miss today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture, because it's a very difficult concept. So you might want to pay very close attention. Well, I'm trying to see who just walked, but everybody who's here, welcome. It's taking attendance is a royal pain in the neck, but I have to do it. All right, all right, so I think we're close enough. We're ready to start. All right, um, we're doing chapter six. So I have to do what I always have to do here. Minimize this, minimize this. Go over here, recent items, chapter six. Right, now I got to... Maximize this. Who the hell just came in? I don't think anybody did. All right. Doesn't matter. I have to start the class. It's more important. All right. Um, share. Okay. I assume you can see all this. Uh, Now, the last one we did was TCPIP, all that stuff about TCP being connection oriented, all that about the SYNAC Act. You're going to need all that on my next test. So you say, wait a minute, we finished that. Why are we doing another chapter on it? Because now we're going to talk about numbers. Now we're going to talk about um, IP addressing. And this is not hard, but it's, I, I'll just say it's tricky. So follow me on this slowly. And this class hasn't seen this yet, so I'll be very careful on this. Whoever came in, I can't do attendance now. Okay, so the first thing is TCPIP 32 bits. Now, you did well on the first test. The first test was about what? The first test was about the MAC address, the MAC address is what? 48 bits, this, this bit, this is what? 32 bits. Uh, all the people coming in, I can't take attendance. You just have to, don't leave early. <clears throat> so, 32 ones and zeros expressed in four dotted decimal numbers. Now let me go on and talk about octets, but if you won't see this from here, you'll really see it when I show it to you. And here's a slide I'll show it to you. So, 192. This is the 8-bit binary number that represents 192. 168. This is the 8-bit binary number that represents 168. 14. This is the 8-bit binary number that represents 14. And 250. Take my word for it. This is the 8-bit binary number that represents 250. So what do you have? 192, 168, 14, 250. So, 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits and 8 bits. What's 8 times 4? 8 times 4 is 32. What do we say? IP addresses are 32 bit numbers divided into four 8 bit values called octets. Each decimal number represents, represents 8 ones and zeros. That is how we express IP. Now, for the last test, you knew that the MAC address was a 48 bit address expressed in hexadecimal. IPv4, or TCP IP, is, is a 32-bit address expressed in what's called dotted decimal. 
Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. You got to know all that stuff. Yeah. Gets much harder after this. This is way too easy. I assume that dead silence means you're all understanding this. Okay. Now, binary math. Well, I'm not going to do much on this, except I'm going to skip ahead. Does everybody see that this is the binary number system? One, two, four, eight, sixteen. So, I wonder if I can do some drawing with my little thing that I... that I got for this. Now, let me see how this is going to work. All right, so that's a, that's a zero, zero, one. That's binary one. There's a one in the ones column. If I write that, zero, one, zero. That's binary two. There's a one in the twos column. Now, here's the last one I'm going to do. What if I do zero, one, one like that? That's a one. That's a two. What's one plus two? Three. So what if I do this? Uh, I, I shouldn't have done it. I can't. Have, so if I had one and two zeros, that would be four. Why? It would be a one in the ones column over the fourth column. So they're telling me that 125. If you add 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4, but don't add 2 and do add 1, that would be a number of 125. Just like here. Why is this 3? Because 2 plus 1 is 3. That's how binary numbers work. Okay, now I know what you're going to say. Do I have to know the binary number system? Not really, but you have to be familiar with it because it's going to come back to haunt us when we do other things in a few minutes. All right, let's keep going. Now, they want to talk about these class A and class B and class C addresses. Here I have to go out of order. So all this slide 13, slide 14, we have to know all this stuff. But I'm going to skip all the way ahead to this and call it subnetting and a subnet mask. Now, I have no place to write, but let me try what a subnet mask is. Let's say we're all 192.14.12, okay? So I'm 192.14.12.1. You're 192.14.12.2. You're 14.12.3. You're 14.12.4. You're 14.12.5. But one poor loser is 192.14.13. something. Well, as long as we're all 192.14.12, I can be one, you can be two, you can be three, we can all talk to each other. But the poor loser who's 192.14.13, he or she can't talk to anybody else because he's, he or she's on the wrong subnet. In other words, we all have to have the first three bytes the same, and the last one can be different, so we're all different. Now, how do I enforce that? How do I make sure that we're all on the same subnet? How do I make sure that everybody who's 14.12 can talk to each other, everybody who's 14.13 can't? And that's what's something called a subnet mask. And this is a very tricky concept. I don't know how to do that. Make it easy. So here it is. Um, calculating the subnet mask. So let's say we all have to be 192. Well, 192, I happen to know, is binary 1, binary 1, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. But the mask out of that is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. They say, wait a minute, all 1s isn't 192. Right? All 1 simply means we all got to be 192. Now, 14. Binary 14 is a bunch of zeros, a few 1s, and a bunch of zeros. But the mask under that is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. You say, wait a minute, Professor, all 1s isn't 14. That means we all got to be 14. Next one is binary 12. Binary 12 is a whole bunch of zeros and just a couple of 1s. But the mask under that is a bunch of ones. That means we all got to be 14. So we all got to be 192, 14, 12. Now, I'm dot one, you're dot two, you're dot three. The mask under that is zero, 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 zero. You say, I don't know my binary, but I know that if I'm dot 14, it's not all zeros. No, the mask means we all can be changing. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a subnet mask something like this. I don't know if I still have my... Now I got to do it this way. Screw you. (laughs) 
So here it is. One, 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 dot. One, 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 two, four, one, two, three, four, dot. One, it should be eight of them. I don't know if I'm counting right. Dot. What this says is, we all have to be 192 because that's under these first ones over here. We all have to be 14 here, dot 12. But you can be dot one, you can be dot two, you can be dot three because the number under the mask can be different. So all the numbers under the mask have to be the same. So if we're, and again, that does not mean that eight ones is 192. It just means you have to be 192. It doesn't mean that eight ones is 14. We just have to be all 14. It doesn't mean that eight ones is 12, we have to be 12. And it certainly doesn't mean that all zeros is four. It simply means we can all be four. Let's, set, let's make this a six. We can do it with one thing. You know what I'm saying? So don't confuse, the number on top is the number. Number below is the mass. Now, here comes the big problem. We express this mass as 255.255. .255 dot two five five dot zero. Oh, wait, where'd you get that? I'll tell you where I got it. If you add one plus two plus four plus eight plus sixteen plus thirty two plus sixty four plus one twenty eight, you're gonna get two five five. And if you add one plus two plus four plus eight plus sixteen plus thirty two plus sixty four plus one twenty eight, you're gonna get two five five. And the same thing here. But if you add zero plus zero plus zero plus zero you're going to get zero. So the subnet mask here is three two fifty fives and one zero. Remember, one ninety two fourteen twelve dot six is the address. The mask is two five five two five five two five five zero. Now, what does that tell us? We all have to be one ninety two. We all have to be fourteen. We all have to be twelve. But as far as the six goes, if I'm six, you can be seven. If you're seven, you can be eight. If you're eight, you can be nine. Number of the zeros can and should change. Number under the ones is not allowed to change. That is your subnet mass. Now, you say, oh, I understand that, Professor. Well, I bet you do. Let's go back. Let's start over now. We already said that the IPv4 TCB IP is a 32-bit binary number expressed in four dotted decimal octets. And here it is. 11 represents 192. 1010011 is 168. 0011110 is 14. And this stupid number here is 250. But now let's go down here. Look at the mass. This 255 is these eight ones. This 255 is these eight ones. This 255 is these eight ones. And this zero is these eight zeros. There's your address and there's your mask. You know what I mean? The network ID port is the 192.168.14. And the host part that can change is the 250. You could be 248. I could be 247. You could be 241. But we all have to be 192.168.14. I assume that that silence means you're understanding this, but you really do have to know this. And I know it's hard to teach this way. I hope that my little... Uh, a uh, pen thing helps, but it's not the best way to teach. The better way would be the blackboard. But we're doing what we can do, and we're, we're all stuck. So now, and that's that. And now we just covered this. I'm not going to cover this again, but I'll do it one more time. Do you see why this guy here is 125? Because here if I add... One, I don't add the two. I add one plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64, but I don't add this in. That is 125. And that's 001 binary one. 010 is binary two. But 011 is binary two plus one, which is binary three. And I'm done with that. Now, here we get to the problem. Class A, Class B, and Class C. Well, Professor, you said the first three octets always have to be the same. Well, maybe. What if I only want the first octet to be the same? So what if I gave you a first octet of 10? You all have to be 10. 
You could be 10.5.7. You could be 10.9.2 as long as we're all 10. He said, wait a minute. I thought you said it has to be the first three. Well, let's see if I can do this on here as good as I can. Supposing I do, now I got to do it this way. I got to go back up here. Now, supposing I do this, 10 dot x dot x dot x. Watch. Now, you see what I just did? We, as, as long as you're 10, 9, 7, 10, 2, 8, it doesn't matter. But the subnet mask on that one is only 1, 2, 55. Only the first one has to be the same. Now, let's take a class B. Supposing I do 132.14.x.x. This subnet mask, I'll draw it down here, would be 255.255.255. You see what I mean? And that one, only the first two have to be the same. So let's look at the top. The top one says 10 dot anything dot anything dot anything. If you're 11, you're screwed. But as long as you're 10, you're okay. That's a class A. The first doctor has to be the same. Class B, we all have to be 132.14. But you could be 14.12.9. You could be 14.16.84. As long as we're 32.14, we're the same. That subnet mask is only two 255s. And finally... This is the one we just covered. I hope that I don't have to hit the, the thing again. I think I do. Fuck you. I, I don't know how I can do that, but there it is. So, with this one, it's, this is the 192.14.12.x. And this would be 255. Dot two five five dot two five five. That would be your class C. So the three two fifty fives means the first three octets have to be the same. The two two fifty fives means the first two octets have to be the same. And the one two fifty five means only the first octets to be the same. That is your subnet masking your class A, class B, and class C. On my next test, there's only three possible subnet masks. What are they? 1, 2, 55, 2, 2, 55s, or 3, 2, 55s. That's it. Okay? I'm assuming that dead silence means you're understanding this. I, some of you have been missing a few lectures. Those who are making a guest appearance, you certainly came to the right one. Be sure to come to Wednesday's lecture because it's going to get even harder. Will this stuff be on my next test in two weeks? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Don't worry about class D and class E. They're reserved for something else. Class D is for multitasking. Class E is for experimental use. But you could, should understand what a class A is, what a class B is, and what a class C is. Okay? And again, class A, only the first octet is to be the same, and the subnet mask is 1, 2, 55. Class B, the first two octets are to be the same, and the subnet mask is 2, 2, 55. For the class C, Three octets have to be the same, and the subnet mask is 3255. Again, I'm assuming the dead silence means you're all understanding this, and it's very easy. By the way, this seems tricky at the beginning, but this is really not hard stuff. It's just you've never seen it before. Now, this one I have to cover, but I hate it, and there's no logic to it. I just have to tell you. Private IP addresses means a class A address that begins with 10 or a class B address that begins with 172, 16, 17, or 18, or a class C address that begins with 192, 168, they're reserved for privacy. What that means is, now here it is. Can somebody have a 10 or a 172, 16 address on the NIC card? Yes, they can. Can they use it on the network? Yes, they can. Read my lips. Can they use it on the internet? No, they can't. The addresses in these ranges can't be used on the internet. So could you have it as your address? Yes, you could. Could you use it on a local network? Yes, you could. Could you use it on the internet? It would not be allowed to be used. Now, a lot of people say, Professor, I don't like to memorize things. There must be some logic to this. There's some mathematical reason for this. And the sad answer is no. Someone simply decided on these numbers. So because someone said 10 is private, 
because someone said 172.16 is private, and because someone said 192.168 private, they are. There's no logic behind it, you just have to know it. They can be used on a local network, but they can't be used on the internet. Why? Because someone said so. That's the only reason. But by the way, because someone said so, they will not go across the internet. They just won't go across the internet because the routers won't pass them. You have to know that. Well, I'd say it this way, that won't be on my test, no. But anyone taking the Net Plus certification, you absolutely have to know this kind of stuff. This is exactly what they ask. Oh, wow. Now, this bottom one is the worst one of all, but I'm going to lecture on it just because I'm so brilliant and you're so brilliant. What is APIPA? Well, um, you have to know for my next test from last week, and I hope a few of you weren't here last week, you better know your DHCP code. Remember what DHCP was. You need an address and you couldn't find one, so it gives you one. Automatically assigned an address with a computer confined to receive an address of DHCP, right? Well, what would happen if the DHCP server is not there or if DHCP isn't working? Now, not working means it's defective or someone kicked the wire out. It doesn't matter. You're going to get your, your address from DHCP, but for some reason you can't because a wire was kicked out. You know what's going to happen? Your own computer will assign you an address, and it will assign you an address of 169.254. So if DHCP doesn't work, your own computer will assign you an IP address. Now you say, well, wait, Professor, I'm missing this completely. I knew what DHCP does. It assigns an address and I don't have one. If my own computer could have assigned one all along, why bother? Well, here's the why bother. It's very important. DHCP will assign you the correct address. If you can't get the correct address from DHCP, your own computer will assign you an address okay, but it will be what I call the booby prize address. It will be an incorrect address of 169.254.1. something. Now, wait a minute. What if our network that we're on is 192.14.12? And what if you have an address of 169.254? You know what you got? Goose egg. You got Zippo because you have an address okay, but you can't hang out with us. You're often, you're a pariah. So will you get an address from APIVA? Yes. Will it be the right address? No. Will it be of any use to you? No. Now, I've always wondered privately what the point of this is. In other words, if you don't get an address, I'll give you one, but it'll be the wrong one. You say, well, you give me the wrong one. I can't use it. Yeah, but all the APIPA people can talk to each other, I guess. So none of those is what they'd ask you on a test. Here's what they'd ask you on a test. And the smart people pay attention. The geniuses pay attention to this. They'd ask a question like this. You check your IP address, and you find out the address of your computer is 169.254.1.49. What can you conclude? Gee, I don't know. What can I conclude? You can conclude a lot of things. Here's what you can conclude. First of all, you can conclude that you did not have a static IP address. You can conclude you were trying to use DHCP. You can further conclude that even though you were trying to use DHCP, for some reason, it didn't work. You didn't get a DHCP address. Look, no DHCP service was available. Now, you can't conclude why. Was it a broken wire? Was it a defective server? You don't know why, but it wasn't available. Can you conclude anything else? Yes, you can also conclude that you got the booby prize. Because you couldn't get the DHCP address you're supposed to get, you were getting the fake address from APIPA. That's what you conclude. So they won't ask you what would happen if doesn't work, well, they don't ask that. They'll say, you find you have an address of 169.254.4.7. What can you conclude? One, you were trying to use DHCP. Two, you were unable to use DHCP. Three, you got assigned an address by APIPA. I've got nothing more to say on that. You either understand it or you don't. A uh, big quid that, though, that probably won't be on my test, no. But that would absolutely definitely be on the Net Plus test if you took it. That's one of their favorite things to ask. By the way, knowing on my test difference between DHCP and DNS, that's a given. You better know that or don't bother show up to the test. But that's from last week's lecture. The few of you who missed the last few, ch I've seen, took attendance. I'm not going to call out names. A few of you have missed some, some lectures. Be sure to know Chapter 5 cold. And I'm not repeating it. But be sure to know that for the next test. All right, let's keep going.
Okay, this is difficult and hint, hint, hint. This will absolutely definitely be on my next test. And I may lose my pen again. Let's try the bottom. It's called CIDR, C-I-D-R, but class of internet domain routing. It's the way you draw it. Now, let me just show you something. You've got 172, 31, 2, 10, 10. Remember what I said, that's useless by itself. You also need a subnet mask. So there's the address, there's the mask. Now, what does that tell you? We all have to be 172, 31, and 210 because it's under the 255, but everybody should be different here. If I'm 10, you should be 11. If you're 11, you should be 12, 12, 13. We all gotta be these three numbers, but everybody should be different with the last number because that's the number in the zeros. Be cuidado, we have to write both numbers down. We have to write this and this. Now, watch carefully, the geniuses pay attention. Okay, I'd rather write it this way. Now, why would I write 172, 210 slash 24? What does that got to do with anything? In my other class, somebody had a question on this, so pay attention. 255, how many binary ones is that? Eight, ocho. 255, how many binary ones is that? Eight, ocho. And how many binary ones is this 255? Eight. How many zeros is this? Eight zeros. Well, what's eight and eight and eight? What's three times eight? That's 24. So in other words, instead of writing these two numbers, I could write this and I would know the slash 24 represents 24 ones. Eight ones here, eight ones here, eight ones here, and zero ones here. Network ID is 24 using eight bits for the host ID. You would have to know that 24 is 3255. And we're not done. Does everybody see that? 255 is eight ones. The second 255 is eight ones. The third 255 is eight ones. What's three times eight is 24? It gets worse. You're going to see it differently. Now, I have to do this here. Now, they're not going to ask you how to get from here to here because you say, Professor, I got that. I can see that. I'm pretty smart. Here's what I'm going to ask you. If you have this number, what is the subnet mass? So you would have to know that slash 24 is this. Now, I'm going to do one that's a little bit tricky. I'm going to draw it right on here, too. And I think I have to go through the whole... Yeah, 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 I have to go. Yeah, I have to do this. Screw you. Okay, now watch. Supposing I did 130.14.6.9 slash 16. Now, what's the subnet mass for slash 16? Well, the subnet mass for slash 16 is 255 here, 255 here, 0, 0. Why? What's 8 bits plus 8 bits? That's slash 16. So no one's going to say, how do I get from here to here? They're going to say, if you have a slash 24, what's the subnet map? Now let's try another one. 10. What's slash 8? Well, slash 8 is 255. Why? Because that's 8 bits. No one's going to ask, how do I get from here to here? I'm sorry, no one's going to tell you to get from here to here. They're going to say, if you have a slash 8, what's the equivalent subnet mass? If you have a 16, what's the equivalent subnet mass? If you have a 24, what's the equivalent subnet mass? Okay? I'm pausing. Not only would that be on their test, but that would be on my test coming up. Now, I want to pause for a minute because I, one of the smartest people in my other class had a question. Does everybody understand this slide? How the slash 24 is the 3, 255? how the slash 16 is the 2, and how the dot is the 1. I'm just pausing. Everybody gets this. Nobody has a question. I'm going to move on slowly. All right. I'm assuming this is a pretty small class. I'm assuming the dead silence means you're understanding. It. You're learning to speak what I call, I don't know how to say it. You're not really learning binary. You're learning how to do TCP IP. Now, again, Chapter five, which we all have to know, all that stuff about the SYNAC Act and the people who missed that, you got to know that for my next test. But we also have to know this stuff. So chapter five was the concept of TCP IP. This is the numbering of TCP IP, all right? I'm pausing just to get my breath. 
Well, I'm assuming we're all understanding this. This is the CIDR notation, and you would need to know this for my test. One more time, just quickly, I'm going to be doing this, and this is Monday. Monday and Wednesday, we're finishing with this chapter. So I may be able to do some of this over again and finish the chapter, but by Monday, Wednesday, I must be done with this. Next week, we're going on to Chapter 7, and I'll do a review next week for a test the week after, which would be on this stuff. I'm not, oh, oh, now I have to make a big speech to you. And this is tricky, right? We already did this with the subnet mass. We did this before, right? Now, there's such a thing as what's called variable length or custom subnetting. I want to just tell you a quick thing about that. On my upcoming test, there's only three possible subnet mass. That is three 255s, two 255s, or one 255. Let me do it again. Only three possible subnet mass. One 255, two 255s, or three 255s. Class A, class B, and class C. There is such a thing as variable length subnet masking, which is a bear. It's really hard. Now, here's my little speech on this. We're going to stop uh, teaching for a minute and give a speech on the light, the price of bananas. Variable length subnet masking is not part of this course. I will not put it on my final exam. So a student says, oh, great. I don't have to know it. It makes the course easier. And it does, yeah. But a few students, and this class has some pretty smart ones. I'm not going to tell you who your names are. Say, so, you know, professor, I want to get the actual certification here. And if you leave out variable length subnet masking, I won't be able to get the cert. So I went through leaving it out, then I went through putting it in and half the class failed. So now what I'm gonna do is the following. We're leaving it out for now. I'm skipping a whole bunch of slides. We're only covering 12 chapters and we have like 15 weeks. Near the end, we'll have one extra week. For that one extra week near the end, I will be giving a three hour lecture on variable length subnet masking. It's extremely difficult. Good news, it will not be on my final exam. The bad news is if anybody wants to get certified, it will be on the certification, okay? The good news, again, is I said it's difficult, but really for the smart people, it's not. For the marginal people, it's going to be tricky. For the smart people, you'll get it. So we are going to have a three-hour lecture on variable length subnet masking sometime near the end of the semester. We're leaving it out for now, and it won't be on your next test. That way, those who want to get the certification will get it. Oh, and it won't be on my final either. So you just have to you listen to it, learn it if you can, and if you don't know, it's up to you. But I don't feel guilty because I've taught the course the right way. And also, I enjoy it. As a teacher, I enjoy teaching the hard stuff more than the easy stuff. It's more fun. All right. So now we're done. We have, this is this variable length stuff that we're going to leave out. But again, don't worry that we're leaving it out because we're really not. We're postponing it. Okay, I'm going to go over this because this is sort of a summary. We already covered this, but it's important that we know this because we covered it and want to make sure if we do. So rules for IP addressing, IPv4. We're going to do IPv6 in a few minutes. Let's see. It's coming up on 4 o'clock. We'll finish today at 4.15 or so, and I'm going to redo much of this on Wednesday. So if you're not understanding it, be sure to be here Wednesday to catch it. And we're not doing it again next week. Okay, the top dot. Oh, it's going to be a saying class A, class B, or class C. Okay, what is that? Well, we already covered it. The class A is the 1, 2, 55, and only the first dot has to be the same. The class B is 2, 2, 55, and the first two numbers have to be the same. We have to be 1, 32, 14, but you can be any two numbers you want at the end. And the class C is 3, 2, 55, and the first three numbers have to be the same. We all got to be 192.14.12 in a class C. In a class B, we all got to be 132.12. That's it. In a class A, we all got to be just 10 or just 11. So understand what the class A, class B is, and understand what the subnet mask is for class A, class B, and class C. Line two, every IP address must have a subnet mask. A number without a mask is useless. Now you can write... 192.14.12.84 and put 255, 255 to under it, or you can write 192.14.12.254 slash 24. Whichever way you do it, you must have a subnet mask. All hosts must share the same number. If we're all 192.14.12, we all got to be 192.14.12. 
Now, you can be 12.4, you can be 12.9, you can be 12.8, but we all got to be 14.12. Must have the same network ID. But all host IDs must be unique. If you're 14.12, then you better be 14.13. And if you're 14.13, you better be 14.14. There shouldn't be two 14.13s on there. Um, you can't assign with all zeros and all ones. That's true, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. Now, this is a sexy one. We all got to be 192.14.12. And we said this poor loser over there is 192.14.13. Well, what's that person, guy or girl like? That's a loser. He's out of whack. How could that 192.14.13 join us? Well, there's really two ways. The, the one way is change him to a 14.12 so he's like us. You're 14.13. You're a pariah. We change it to 14.12. You're like us. He said, wait, wait. I want to still be 14.13, but I want to talk to you. Is that possible? Well, you're not on our subnet, so it's not possible that way. But there's another way you can. And that is supposing you go through a router. Now, for those who understood chapter one, two, and three, what, what do switches do? Switches make LANs. What do routers do? Routers connect LANs to other LANs. Well, a subnet is more a local area network. So what we're saying is the guy on 1413 is on the wrong subnet, the wrong LAN. Can he ever talk to us? Not normally, but if he goes through a router, he can. Routers connect different subnets. Routers connect different LANs. So... Anyone with a different network ID can talk to someone on our ID only if they go through a router, the middle line. Okay. And I think that's it for this slide. Uh, now we get to what I don't like. I'm, we're going to stop about quarter after. This part of the lecture is important, but I just don't like it as much. And this I think you'll understand. I'll tell you why. We're done for a while with numbers. Now, I, I'm going to, on Wednesday, go through the Class A, Class B, Class C, and go through the subnet of masking and gangs. I think it's important. But I think we're done with numbers. All right, so uh, multiple IP addresses. This is a very unimportant slide. Can a single NIC card have two or three IP addresses? You know what? Legally, it can, but it's kind of useless and no one ever does it. One more time. Can a single card have more than one IP address? It can, but it's seldom done. Skip that slide. However, can I have what's known as a multi-ohm server? That is very important, and that I'm going to go over. Can I have a file server or a computer that has one, two, or three network interface cards? In other words, here's a NIC card, here's a NIC card, here's a network. It's got three cards in there. Is that possible? It sure as hell is. And if that's true, you have one big rule. Every network interface card must have its own IP address. So if NIC card is 192.14.12.44, this NIC card and this NIC card better have a different IP address. Uh, that's a multi-ohm server. A multi-ohm server is several NIC cards. I'm going to come back to this. I have to skip ahead. And here's a multi-ohm server. This guy is 172 172.14.208. And by the way, notice the slash 24, that means 3255, so it goes to NIC card. This NIC card is 192.168. So here's what's happening. If I want to talk to the 192.168 network, I come out of this network card. If I want to talk to the 172.16 network, I come out of this network card. This computer talks to these guys through this NIC card and these guys through this NIC card. Is that possible? It sure as hell is, and that's what's meant to be done. End of lecture, right? Now watch carefully. Could one of these guys talk to this server through this NIC card? Sure he could. But could one of these guys go through this server to talk to one of these guys over here? He absolutely could. Could somebody over here talk to the server through this NIC card? Of course he could. Could somebody over here go through this server to talk to this guy over here? And the answer is he could. Now, it says here that multi-ohm servers can run into routing issues due to multiple blah, blah, blah. Now, let's, let's see what that really means. When one computer with one, one subnet talks to another computer on another subnet, they can't do it unless they go through what? Something called a router. Oh, wait, it's going through a multi-ohm server. Read them and weep, everybody. A multi-ohm server is really nothing more than a router. As a matter of fact, a router is nothing more than a computer with a lot of network interface interfaces in it. See what I mean? You say, well, wait, a router doesn't have a keyboard and monitor. 
That's right. It's missing a keyboard and monitor, but a router is just a computer with a lot of multiple NIC cards in it. What they mean by that line at the end is, if th this is a router, but if we've got regular routers doing routing, and this router is set up this way, it becomes what I call an accidental router. In other words, it's doing routing even though it wasn't intended to. You screw up your other routers. But if you intended to make this a router and configured it to be a router, it's perfectly legal. This is a router. What's a multi-ohm server? Different network interface cards on the same computer, and each one of those must have its own IP address. And again, notice how they're using the slash 24. <clears throat> All right, let's keep going. We only have 10 or 15 more minutes to go. Uh, but this is a long thing. I want to get to as far, much as I can. Oh, this is a bear of a lecture. But you're going to like it for another reason. I don't, have to, I don't have to do any friggin' numbers, okay? This is all just commands. Hint, hint, hint. Some of these commands would be on my next test. Right? IP config command line tools, okay, that do things. Let's go. I'm thinking for a minute as well. All right, let's go. Let me skip around. IP config is a command. You type in the from IP config, and you know what it tells you? The top dot. Display computer's IP address settings. Here's what I want to know. What is my TCP IP address? And if I type in IP config enter, it will tell me my IP address. That's all? Well, you know something else. My IP address is kind of useless unless I have what? I also need a subnet mask. So it's gonna tell me what's my IP address, what's my subnet mask. Now, minor cuidado. It doesn't matter if it's a static IP address or it doesn't matter if I got it through DHCP. What address do I have at this moment? IP config, what is my IP address and what is my subnet mask? Right? Okay, we're done, right? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, professor. There's something else that's kind of important. What about my MAC address? Could I find that out too? Well, no, IP config just gives you your IP address, your subnet mask, unless you do IP config slash all. And that says, show me everything about me you can tell me. So give me my IP address and my subnet mask. But is there anything else you can tell me? What about my MAC address? Yes, put that in too. Now, it gives me a lot of other things that we haven't covered. Things like your, um, what they call subnet options, and your, your, the thing that the DHCP server puts in, which I'm not going to bother. But IP config slash all gives me my MAC address in addition. I'm not going to bother to talk about these bottom ones, but I'm going to talk about these two, just because um, people who were not here last week pay close attention. People who were here last week pay even closer attention. What if I do IP config release or renewal? What does that do? Well, you remember when we talked about DHCP, and yes, you will have to know DHCP on my next test. What does that do? It leases you an IP address, but it doesn't give it to you permanently. It leases it for what? A certain amount of time. Remember the 50% of the time you have to renew it, and when 87.5% of the time is up, you have to get a new one. Well, how would you renew an address? 50% of the time is up, it automatically renews itself. What if you say, you know what? 20% of the time is up, but I friggin' want to renew my address. What can I do about it? IP config renew says renew your DHCP address even though your time's not up. Just do it because you want to, and I'll let you. But the sexier one, the good one, is the one above it. You'll keep renewing your address every 50% of the time. So remember, if you have a 14-day address, every seven days you renew it. But what if you say, you know what? I just don't like this IP address. I want to get rid of it. Hey, DHCP gave it to you. What are you going to do about it? Well, if you type in IP config slash release, that says simply get rid of my IP address. Release it. Instead of renewing it, throw it in the trash. I don't like it. Now, here's the cuidado. It will automatically release it okay, and that's good. But there's a problem there. You now will be naked. You won't have an IP address. Well, what's going to happen? Now, again, the people missing you got to know that Dora process. You're going to do another Dora. You're going to do another query, another IP, TCP IP discover. Because your computer is going to say, I'm naked. i got no address. I need one. I'm going to do a discover offer requesting knowledge. That will happen automatically. So IP config release says, get rid of my current IP address. What's then going to happen is you're going to say, I'm naked. I have no IP address. And your computer is going to start initiate a Dora to try to get a new IP address. 
I'm just putting those in because you would know them, but you wouldn't realize you would know them. See what I mean? IP config, a command to display my current IP address and my current subnet name. Right? You do have to understand DHCP for my next test. Now, the ping command. The ping is like if I stick a, if you're in front of me and I stick a pin in your shoulder, you're out. You know what that's told me? You're not unconscious, you're not drunk, you're not passed out, and you're awake and listening. If I stick a pin in your shoulder, you don't mention anything, maybe you're unconscious. <laughs> so, Pinging you is saying, are you there? So it uses an ICMP echo request, and it looks for an ICMP echo reply. For those who were here for last week's lecture, and those who aren't better know this, ICMP is what? One of the sub-protocols of TCP IP. That echo request is, are you there? Echo reply is, I am there. One ping command sends four of them. So you ping you four times. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And it says, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Are you there, are you there, are you there, are you there, is the echo request? Yes, I'm here, yes, I'm here, yes, I'm here, is the echo reply. What does ping use? It's a command that says it tests connectivity. Are you there, yes or no? By the way, if it fails, it doesn't tell you why. I mean, is your computer down, is the wire out, is your switch defective, is the router defective, I don't know. I just can't talk to you and you can't talk to me. Know that ping uses the ICMP echo request and the ICMP echo reply. And that ICMP is a sub protocol of TCPIP. ARP. Now, again, for those who missed last week, you better know ARP for my test. What does it do? ARP is the one that resolves or, or changes, tells you, IP address to a MAC address. It resolves an IP address to a MAC address. Big cuidado, not the other way around. It can't get them. It can't get an IP address from a MAC address. It gives you the equivalent MAC address to an existing IP address. Very important. That's the ARP process. What does the ARP command do? Well, if you remember, the first packet comes in and resolves it. Second packet comes in and resolves it. And the computer says, what are you, stupid? I just told you that. So to keep happening every time, we store the results in the ARP cache. What's in the ARP cache? IP to MAC address pairs. IP address to MAC address pairs that were just resolved by the ARP process. All the ARP command does is shows us the contents of the ARP cache. All the ARP command does is displays the current ARP entries in the ARP cache. Now, do I have to really know what ICMP means? Do I have to really know what ARP means? Do I have to really know what DHCP means? Do I have to really know what DNS means? Yes, 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 and absolutely yes. Okay. It's the secret to passing my test, the secret to passing the real test. So you do have to know all this stuff. I'm watching my watch. We're coming up on 10 after, 10 or 12 more minutes and we'll be done. But uh, we have a lot more to do. So the more I get in this time, the less I have to do next time. Now, trace routes, what I call on ping on steroids. If I ping you over there, I say you're there, okay. I'm here, you're across the hall, I ping you. I say, we got connectivity. Big cuidado. If you're in California, can I ping you? No, I can't. What will it tell me? In California, and I'm here, I pinged you, it says you're there, you're awake, you're alive. You and I have connectivity across the entire United States if I can ping you and you can ping me. Lecture's over. One problem. I wish I knew how I got to you in California. Well, ping doesn't tell me that. Ping just says, I got to you, you got back. Well, did we go through a router in Montana? Did we go through one in Arizona? How did I get there? I have no idea. I just know I can ping you, you can ping me. I'd like to know how I got there. That's trace route. Trace route, T-R-A-C-R-T, displays the route the packets took. It shows you every router you went through. Now, there's no, in the old slides, there were pictures that would show me a great slide to show me. They don't show me that here, so I can't do it. It shows me every router I went through from here to California by TCP IP address. Well, gee, that's useful, but why do I care what the address is? Well, that's because most routers have names to them. So you can name a router, router one, and router two. But most people don't do that. Most people name a third floor router, a second floor router, a first floor, or Acme router. See what I'm saying? 
So if you go through a router called Tulsa 1, or you go through a router called San Diego 3, or you go through a router called Phoenix 1, you can pretty well conclude that those routers are in those cities. So if I can show all the routers by address and name, and the routers are named properly, I will now know which cities I went through to get there. What does trace route do? It shows me the actual route the packet took. What does ping do? It just says, are you and I connected without showing the route? And this one I really like because this one is very difficult, but very easy. I've got an address called www.cheapcameras.com, www.cheapcameras.com. And you know what? I'd like to know the IP address of whoever's hosting that. Who is this SOB who's selling cheap cameras? I'd like his IP address. Well, can I just ask, what's the IP address of www.cheapcameras.com? I can. I can do an NSLOOKUP. NSLOOKUP, show me the address of www.cheapcameras.com. Well, how would NSLOOKUP go about doing it? It would use the DNS process. Now, again, for the two or three people who I took attendance this morning who missed last week's lecture, you better find out how DNS works. But for those smart people who are here, remember what DNS did. It translates a fully qualified domain name to an IP address and then takes you to that address. Well, I don't want to go to that address. I want to find out. So if I click on www.microsoft.com, DNS is going to take me there. But if I do an NS lookup www.microsoft.com, you know what the NS is going to do? It's going to say, here's the address you want. But I'm not going there. It's up to you to figure it out. So NS lookup uses the DNS resolving process. Remember what that was? How it goes to the .com server and says, where's the Microsoft server? Where's the Microsoft? Where's the www? And then it resolves it. It uses that whole query process to resolve it, but it just gives you the address and doesn't take you there. I'm not worried about this interactive mode and how you use NSLOOKUP. I'm worried that NSLOOKUP is the command line version of DNS, or it's a command line command that uses a DNF process to get me an address, but doesn't necessarily take me to the address. It just tells me what it was. Why bother to have a completely new system? We already have DNS that's doing it. NSLOOKUP is just the command line version of DNS. I'm going to do this in a minute, but I want to go back one. So, what does IP config do? Again, what is my IP address and what is my subnet mask? What does ping do? Test connectivity. Are you there? Yes or no? What does ARP do? Well, the ARP process does one thing. The ARP command does something else. The ARP command shows me the contents of the ARP cache. What does trace route do? Well, trace route traces the actual route, it's ping on steroids, and shows me every router I went through to get there. And what does NSLOOKUP do? Well, NSLOOKUP is the command line version of DNS, and again, from my test, know what DNS is, and then know that NSLOOKUP is the command line version of DNS. Okay? I'm going to go a little further because it's only 4.12. I think we'll stop after this, but it's a my tricky. Public and private IP addresses, network address translation. Now watch carefully. I'm 1012 and I'm 1011. I want to go on the internet. Now I told you something four, five, ten slides ago. You may have forgotten it. 10 is a private IP address only. You're not allowed to go on the internet with it. I want to go on the internet. How can I do it? This guy will translate and give me a public address. I'm going on the internet as 123.101, even though my address is 10.11. I'm going on the internet as 123.102, even though my real address is 10.02. What year was Susan B. Anthony born? Susan B. Anthony was born in 18-something. Tells me to 101. But I need to get it at 100. The translator's got to translate it back. In other words, a public and a private IP address. Now, the student says, you know what, Professor, I kind of see this lecture. I see what you're doing. But why bother? Why not just go on the internet with a regular address? What are you doing? Well, why is Clark Kent Superman and why is Batman Bruce Wayne? Because they need a secret identity. Everybody knows that 101 and 102 exists. And everybody knows that 101 wants to find out about Susan B. Anthony. Therefore, somebody could attack 101 and 102. 
but no one knows that this guy and this guy exist. This 10.1 and 10.2, no one knows they exist. Could 101 and 102 be attacked? Yes. Could 10.1 and 10.2 be attacked? No, because nobody knows what it is. Do you think that the network address translator is going to pass through an attack? No, it's not. You're able to have a secret identity, a private address, and go on the internet with a public address that the private address never finds out about. And that's a neat thing. It's a security measure. That's network address translation. Understand about a public, and that's why 10 is a private address, because it can't go on the internet, whereas 123.101 and 123.102 can go on the internet. I'm gonna stop this lecture when I do the next slide, but the next slide is very difficult. What if I want to go on with one address? Now, come back to this. Watch carefully. I want to go on with 198.23.100. But I want to go on with two of these people. Forget two. I got 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, and they all want to go here. Well, it's very easy. I can ask a question. You can ask a question. You can ask a question. It's very easy going out. But coming back to the problem, you want some information on cameras, and you want to know when Susan B. Anthony is born. Well, both of that information comes back to 100. How does it know which packet to go to you and which packet to go to you? And the answer is it's called port addressing. We have a distant port number. So watch carefully. Each one's going out on 100, but 1011 is going out on port 5311. And 10.2 10 is going out on 100, but it's port 3105. So anything coming back to 5300, 100 is going to this guy. Anything coming back to 3105 on 100 is going to this guy. Anything coming back to 284 on this guy is going to this guy down here. Let me go through it now and get it. Allow several hundred workstations to access the internet with a single public address. Each packet contains a source and destination IP address, but it's got different port numbers. We come back to the different port number, but the same address. That's port address translation. And that is, I, I'd say, it, a subcategory or a enhancement of NAT, NAT. Now, one last thing. Do you understand how this whole um, course is all kinds of acronyms? And ICMP, P, PING, and all the other stuff. And now we have PAT and NAT. You have to know how PAT is different than NAT and what NAT does and what PAT does. Unfortunately, yes, you do. Okay. I think just because I'm running out of time, wow, this is going to be a tough one, yeah. Um, I'll tell you why. No, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll do this. All right. I think I'm done. I just, I want to, Anna, you're here. I got to see people who aren't here. Uh, we're doing this through uh, this coming uh, meeting. And then next week's the review, the week after that. All this stuff will be on a test. Be sure Chapter 5, and I'm not going to call it the names, but some of you people were not here for Chapter 5. You're going to need that big time on the test, and you're going to need this on the test. Don't anybody miss my Wednesday lecture. All right, I think I'm done. I'm just going to complete the attendance, but anybody who has any questions can ask me. Or you can go home. It's up to you. Anybody has any questions? I'm here. Hey, Professor. Go ahead. What's your question? What is uh, University Day? My brother has uh, Wednesday, and he says he doesn't have school. What is that? What is what, what day? Uh, it's called University Day. It's Wednesday. I have no idea what that is. We have school Wednesday. I have no idea what University Day is. Okay. We have school this Wednesday. All right. All right. Thank you. I have no idea. All right. Thank you. All right. Anybody have any questions? I'm here. All right. I have a question, Professor. Go ahead, Grandma. What's your question? <laughs> uh, I have a question um, about configuring um, IP like four addresses. So, okay, for a host. Did you um, understand that two fifty five stuff? Yeah, I did. Good. Um, however, uh, I just wanted to know because it says that all host IDs on the same network must be unique. And what exactly makes it unique? Um, oh. If I'm 192.14.12.84, then you better be 85. And if you're 85, somebody else better be 86. The host can't be the same. So if there's only 192.14.12.85, it's got to be just you and no one else. 
Everybody mm -hmm. else should be 84, 82, 83. Only one person can be 84. The host has to be unique. The network part has to be the same for everybody, but the host part has to be unique means there's only one nine, you're 10, you're 11, you're 12. There can't be two 12s or two nines. Okay. Gotcha. okay. Very good. Hi, uh, Professor, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, mine's a bit simpler than that, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I just want to confirm to that I am getting it. So the sub uh, net mask is pretty much like when you have a password and it hides a password. So like it kind of hides the IP address. Well, it says the numbers under the ones have to be the same. So what she just asked, if you're one ninety two fourteen twelve dot four dot five, everybody's gotta be one ninety two fourteen twelve. Well who says so? And the answer is the subnet mass says so, because two fifty five is all ones, two fifty five is all ones, two fifty five is all ones. That means the first three numbers have to be the same. With a class B, it's just the first two numbers. You gotta be one thirty two fourteen, the other two numbers can be anything you want. Who says so? Well the subnet mask is only two two fifty five, two sets of ones. So we all got to be 132 because that's on the one set of ones. We all got to be 14. Why can everybody be something else on the others? Because that's all that's under the zeros. Did you understand how 1255 means only the first byte has to be the same? 255 means the two, first two, and of course the other one is the first three. Did you understand any of that? So it's kind of like the representation of the actual uh, address, right? Well, it certifies that we all have, that's why the person who's 14.13 is lost because of those 250, 255s, if you only had 255s, the 14.13 guy would be okay. You see the difference? I'm not sure you understand the 255s. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think you do. Uh, okay. Penella, the exact chapters is four, five, and six. Penella, the exact chapters are four, five, and six. Uh, Joe Lopez, don't go anywhere. Okay. Because I still I still have it in the PowerPoints. I didn't erase them yet, so I don't have to draw anything. Let's go back. You, I can tell you have because no, you didn't do well in the first test. I can tell you're not understanding the course at all. Uh, I think you don't understand this at all. Okay. Do you understand? Why 255, it, this has to be 192 because it's under the ones. This has to be 14 because it's under the ones. This has to be 12 because it's under the one. This could be 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 because it's under the zeros. You see the difference? The 255 represents ones. Now, I do. I know I did it somewhere else. Sure, this guy. This 150 is 14. Only these two have to be the same, six and seven. This could be eight and 12, 14 and 19, because it's under the zeros. And let's take this one. As long as you're 10, you're okay. A guy who's 10, 12, 15, 19, another guy's 10, 18, 47, four, another guy's 10, four, 16, they're all on the same subnet. He said, wait a minute, first, the first three had to be the same. No, as long as you're 10, you're okay, because there's only one 255, and this 255 represents one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that's why the 10 has to be the same. Have you any idea what I'm talking about? I don't think you do. Sorry. Okay. Are you going to do better on the next test? Uh, I certainly hope so, but I'll do effort. Okay. Uh, at least I now I know I do get what study material I have to study. Okay. I don't think you study for the first test at all. No, I study. 